I'm recording this video with permission from Scholastic. So today we're going to be reading chapter 4 of Frindle. Um, think back to what we read last chapter. We left off with Nick getting this huge homework assignment um, from his new teacher, Miss Granger. So Miss Granger has this really bad reputation of like giving all this homework and, and being kind of an intense teacher. And he, Nick, thought he could kind of um, smart his way out of the situation and, and she caught him doing that. She caught him stalling to try to avoid getting homework. And so remember at the end of that chapter, um, Miss Granger assigned Nick a homework assignment explaining where words come from and he had to look it up in the dictionary because Miss Granger is obsessed with dictionaries. So um, that's kind of where we're leaving off and we're going to see Nick um, maybe go through that assignment a little bit. It was a beautiful September afternoon. Bright sun, cool breeze, blue sky, but not for Nick. Nick had to do a little report for the next day, plus copy all of the definitions of 35 words for Miss Granger. This was not the way school was supposed to work, not for Nick. There was a rule at Nick's house, homework first. And that meant right after school. Nick had heard his older brother, James, groan and grumble about this rule for years, right up until he graduated from high school two years ago. And then James wrote home from college after this first semester and said, my grades are looking great because when I came here, I already knew how to put things first. That letter was the proof Nick's mom and dad had been looking for. Homework first was the law from September to June. This had never really bothered Nick before because he hardly ever had homework. Oh sure, he looked over his spelling words on Thursday nights and there had been a few short book reports in fourth grade, but other than that, nothing. Up to now, schoolwork never spilled over into his free time. Thanks to Miss Granger, those days were gone. First, he looked up the definitions in his brand new red dictionary that his mom had bought because Miss Granger told her to. It took almost an hour. He could hear a baseball game in John's yard down the street, yelling and shouting, and every few minutes, the sharp crack of the bat connecting with the pitch. But he had a report to do for Miss Granger. Nick looked at the very front of the dictionary. There was an introduction to the book called words and their origins. Perfect, Nick thought. It was just what he needed to do his report. It would all be over in a few minutes. Nick could already feel the sun and the breeze on his face as he, as he ran outside to play. Homework all done. Without question, this modern American dictionary is one of the most surprisingly complex and profound documents ever to be created, for it embodies unparalleled etymological detail, reflecting not only superb lexicographic scholarship, but also the dreams and speech and imaginative talents of millions of people over thousands of years. For every person who has ever spoken or written English has had a hand in its making. What? Nick scratched his head and read it again. And then again, not much better. It was sort of like trying to read the ingredients on a shampoo bottle. He slammed the dictionary shut and walked downstairs. Nick's family did a lot of reading. So bookshelves covered three of the four walls of the family room. There were two sets of encyclopedias. The black set was for grown-ups and the red set was for kids. Nick pulled out the D volume from the red set and looked up dictionary. There were three full pages with headings like early dictionaries, word detectives, and dictionaries today. Not very exciting, but he had to do it. So Nick just plopped down on the couch and read all of it. There's this picture as well. And when he was finished with the kids book, he opened up the black encyclopedia and read most of what it said about dictionaries too. He understood only about half of what he read. He leaned back on the couch and covered his eyes with his arms, trying to imagine himself giving a report on all of this boring stuff. He'd be lucky to have three minutes worth, but because Nick was Nick, he suddenly had an idea that brought a grin to his face. Nick decided that getting this report could actually be fun. He can make it something special. After all, Miss Granger had asked for it. So I actually want to take us back to earlier where Nick was reading um, the little blurb about dictionaries that he thought was going to give him all the answers and it just ended up confusing him more. Um, there were a lot of big words in these in this paragraph. Some of the words we're not necessarily going to cover like etymological and lexicographic because those are kind of words that are specific to 
how language works and they won't help us too much, but there are several vocabulary words in here that I thought we could look up in the dictionary too, um, just so that we could get a taste of what Nick is going through and also so that we could cover a few words. You might already know some of these words, but if you don't, we're gonna go over them. A really good test to see if you actually know the meaning of a word is if you could describe what the word means to somebody. So sometimes you read it in a sentence and you think, hmm, I know that word. But if somebody asks, well, what does it mean? You have trouble explaining it. That's where dictionaries comes in really handy. So the first word I wanted to look up in the dictionary is the word profound. Some of you guys may know what that word means already, um, but I thought it'd be helpful to get a clear definition from the dictionary. Um, but first I'm gonna remind you what Andrew Clements, how he wrote this. Um, he says, uh, Andrew Clements is the author. He says, the dictionary is one of the most surprisingly complex and profound documents ever to be created. So the word profound in the dictionary, as I read it here, it says that it's an adjective and it says that it is deeply felt, marking, marked by intellectual depth. So that might confuse you a little more, but when they say profound, it kind of means something that is really deep and impactful. So if somebody gives you a really profound speech, it usually means that it really got to you. You understood what they were saying and it made an impact on you. So profound, this, um, the dictionary, what, they're, what he's reading in the dictionary, um, it's claiming that it's a profound, one of the most profound documents to ever be created. So the next word that I thought we could look up is superb. I wonder if you guys know what superb means. If you do, pause this video and tell your sibling, your parent, your dog, your cat, what the word superb means. And if you don't, hang in there because we're gonna find it. So pause the video if you wanted to find that to your buddy at home. When you look up the word superb in the dictionary, the words that it gives us to define it are noble or majestic, rich or magnificent, extremely fine or excellent. Excellent is usually a good synonym that I use for the word superb. Um, so if you wanted to say, this dinner is excellent, um, if you wanted to change it up and not just say good, excellent, whatever, you could say superb. So I challenge you guys, whether you're using the word profound or superb, um, as we go along, those are two vocab words that you probably have heard of before, but now we know the exact definition from the dictionary. I challenge you guys to use at least one of those two words today, whether you're talking about um, the dinner that you're eating tonight or something you read that was really profound. Try to use that in your vocabulary um, today and see, see if your family notices. But for now, that's all, and I will see you guys in our next video.